Thank you, Pat. Morning, church. It's good to see you all. This hot day, it's nice to know who the real Christians are. So, way to show up. How's the smoking section? Doing good, Gordy? All right, <laughs> holding it down. Hey, my name's Pete, and uh, before we come to the sermon for this morning, I want to take just a quick minute um, to remind you that two weeks from today, on July 11th, instead of gathering here at the park, we are inviting the entire church to a day at the lake. And uh, we've got this private camp on uh, Crescent Lake that we've reserved for the day. And um, we're going to start the morning at 11 a.m. with a uh, outdoor worship service on the edge of the lake. Then we'll have a baptism. Then we'll have a big barbecue lunch, and then we'll spend the rest of the day uh, playing in the water and playing volleyball and cornhole and whatever else. So um, I really hope uh, that everyone here can make it, especially if you're kind of new and don't feel like you know anybody yet. Um, this will be a great opportunity to meet some people. So um, I want to take just a minute to help us prepare for the baptism that we're going to do um, that day. And so I would say um, when it comes to baptism, there's basically three types of people in the world and three types of people here today. The first is those who are not Christians and have not been baptized. Secondly, those who are Christians and have been baptized. And thirdly, those who are Christians but have not yet been baptized. So all three groups are welcome here, and we're glad that you're here, but I want to quickly speak to that third group, those who identify as followers of Jesus, but for one reason or another may have not yet been baptized. And that's okay, no guilt or shame, but I want to encourage you to really think seriously about getting baptized this summer, if that's you. Um, the best way I can describe it is like this, that baptism is to following Jesus what a wedding is to marriage. So I had the honor last night of doing uh, Rex and Lori's wedding. And it was a beautiful evening, got to celebrate with a lot of you who are part of their community group. And uh, we had a wonderful time. But what happens at a wedding? Well, it's a ceremony where a man and a woman publicly confess their love for one another. They commit to spending the rest of their lives together, and they identify themselves as permanent partners in relationship. And so anyone who's been married has had a wedding of one kind or another, even if it's small and simple. And so what a wedding is to being married, baptism is to being Christian. So we can debate about um, when you get baptized and how you get baptized and where you get baptized and all that kind of stuff, but there really, amongst Christianity, is no debate itself, no debate about baptism itself. Really, every single Christian tradition and denomination does baptism. And in fact, that's kind of the beauty of it. It's like an initiation, right, into the global historic family of God. That when you're baptized, you are being united with billions of Christians all around the world, all throughout history. And so here at Antioch, we practice what's called credo baptism or believer's baptism, which means rather than baptizing infants, we baptize children and adults who have come to a place where they have received Christ as their Savior, and they're acknowledging Him as Lord of their life, and they are identifying themselves with Christ and His church and His mission of reconciliation within the world. And the method we use uh, here at Antioch is immersion. Rather than sprinkling or anointing or something like that, we take people down under the water, dunk their whole body, and... Um, the reason we do this is that every time someone's baptized, the story of the gospel is retold. Just as Jesus was dead and buried in the ground and then rose again on the third day, we reenact the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, um, identifying with him as we go down into the water fully immersed and then are raised new, clean, and victorious. So this is why ultimately being baptized isn't something we do for God. It's something that God does for us. Baptism isn't about showing everybody how much you love God. It's about God showing everyone how much he loves us. So if you're here today and you haven't yet been baptized, 
I want to encourage you to think about doing so in the lake in two weeks. If you're a kid, talk to your parents about it. They'd love to talk to you. And if you want to get baptized, there's a link on our website. You can find out more about it. One of our pastors would love to talk with you, to meet with you, and get you ready for that. And the rest of us will be there to cheer you on and celebrate that day. So we're off next week, two weeks from today. We are at Crescent Lake. So that said, let's move into the sermon for this morning, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. If you have a Bible, you can turn there. If not, it's printed in your bulletin for you. And uh, Jen told me not to preach too long today because it's going to be so hot. So I've got a nice short sermon for you, and uh, you can thank Jen for that. Um, And the way I'm going to do that is instead of kind of giving you biblical truths and then trying to massage them into your life and encourage you to think about it in your own reality, I'm going to kind of just declare what the Bible's declaring, and we're going to invite the Holy Spirit to massage those truths into our lives. And so there's a lot that could be said in terms of practical application, but I simply want to present what what Paul declares here in the scripture, and we'll trust that God will let his word do his work in our lives. And so here's what's going on in 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Um, This letter was written by the Apostle Paul to one of the early communities of Christians in the city of Corinth, which is in modern day Greece. And one of the things that Paul tried to do as he traveled around was to help various churches get connected to one another. And so he's constantly reminding various congregations that they aren't just autonomous congregations, but they're actually part of one big family. And the specific situation that Paul's dealing with in 2 Corinthians 8 is that there are people in the church in the city of Jerusalem who are really struggling financially. A bunch of the Jewish Christians are poor and they're struggling to make ends meet. And there's probably a few different reasons we know of for their poverty, as there almost always is when it comes to understanding the reasons behind poverty. There's several. The first is that there was a terrible famine happening in the land at the time. This is the year 46 AD during the reign of Emperor Claudius. And so it's really hard for everyone to find food and to find water, and especially in a big, busy city like Jerusalem. Uh, It's hard to imagine, but there was a time when there would be a global crisis and some people would feel the need to hoard a whole bunch of resources for themselves. Toilet paper, that sort of thing. So thankfully, we don't deal with that anymore. But that was the first part of what was going on. There was this major famine. Secondly, um, all Jewish people, including Jewish Christians who lived in the land of Palestine, had to pay double taxes. They had to pay taxes to Rome. And then as Jewish people, they also had to pay taxes to the Jewish authorities. And so they were double taxed. And third, a third reason is that converting to Christianity, and particularly being baptized, basically meant that you were going to be socially and economically ostracized in a place like Jerusalem, where traditional Judaism dominated all of life. And so for the Christians there, following Jesus literally came at a cost. So Christians in Jerusalem are dealing with a natural disaster, they're dealing with unjust tax laws, and they're dealing with religious persecution all at the same time, and therefore many amongst the Jewish congregation are finding themselves financially in need. And so Paul has taken this project upon himself. He's traveling around to other countries and to other regions and to other churches. He's visiting places like Galatia and Macedonia all around Asia Minor. And he is raising money for the poor Christians in Jerusalem who are living in poverty. Fundraising was a big part of Paul's ministry. And this particular project, we think he devoted about five years of his life to actively collecting money from churches that were better off and taking that money and redistributing it among those who were in need. So that's a little bit of context for the passage that we're in this morning. And um, he's writing to this church in Corinth now, 
and encouraging them from a bunch of different angles, five or six different kind of arguments in this text. And he's encouraging them to take up a collection or to take up an offering for their brothers and sisters in Christ who were living in poverty. And he's kind of saying, when you do this offering, it better not just be a few bucks, that this better be a big offering like something that could really make a difference in some people's lives. And so Paul's essentially, real briefly, giving a theology of Christian generosity. A theology of Christian generosity. And all I want to do is highlight three of his main points that I think not only uh, apply to early Christians in Corinth, but also have something to say to us as followers of Jesus living here today. And so the first point of Christian generosity is this, that giving is a means of grace. Number one, giving is a means of grace. In verse seven, Paul lists all these kind of attributes and characteristics of Christian maturity. And at the end, he says, see that you also excel in this grace of giving this grace of giving. So the word grace is used all over this passage. It's the word charis in Greek, and it means to give a good gift. Grace is a good gift. And so we know that the message of the gospel is a a message of grace, that God has given us the good gift of his son and his spirit that we might live with him in his world forever. We know that it's by grace we are saved That grace is the way that we enter the kingdom of God. It's a good gift. But grace is not only the way we enter the kingdom of God, it's also the way we grow and thrive and live in the kingdom of God. Big Grace fan back there. Go Grace. He continues to pour out grace generously into our lives. Grace isn't something we just needed on the day that we came to Christ. Grace is something that we need day by day for the rest of our lives. And God, in his generosity, has chosen various means of grace or pipelines of grace through which he gives the gift of himself to his people. So baptism as we've talked about, is a God-ordained means of grace. It's one of the ways where he said, if you want more of me in your life, then meet me in the waters, and my grace will meet you there. When we come to the communion table and receive the bread and the cup, we see that as a means of grace. But there's many, the scriptures, the word of God themselves, it's a means of grace, a way that God gives himself to us. Prayer and worship, silence, solitude, um, fellowship within community, nature, rest, serving, loving, all these different ways. They're not just moral characteristics or, or good deeds. They are means of grace by which God wants to fill our lives with himself. And what Paul is saying here is that giving, giving away our money, Our stuff, our time, is a means of grace. That when we give generously, we are positioning ourselves in such a way where we can receive life from God. And so this is obviously a countercultural statement that Paul's making for those people at that time and for us at this time. The statement that giving, not getting, is the more blessed way to live. And then he goes on in verse 8, I'm not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. Okay, so Paul's saying, okay, there is grace found in giving. It's not that when you give, God is somehow now obligated or in debt to you and he's going to pay you back in some way or another or in some way that televangelists would promise you on TV. That's not what he's saying. He's saying that the very act of giving, the very act of generosity is in and of itself a means of grace. And he's saying, I'm not commanding you. Try it for yourselves and see. So sometimes I'll cook something up or I'll order something at the restaurant that my kids would think is 
maybe a little bit strange looking, something new to them. And there's some things that I know my kids don't really like to eat, but sometimes there's something that I think they'll really like it if they try it. And so I'll say, hey, try a bite of this. And they'll go, no, I don't want to. I'm like, no, really, I think you're going to like it. And they'll go, do I have to? Well, I'm like, you don't have to. It's not like you have to clean your room or you have to do your homework. I'm just saying, I really think you're going to like it. Um, And am I right most of the time? Most of the time. Um, That's what Paul's doing. He's not saying you don't have to give. I'm not like forcing you to do it. I really think you're going to like it. This really is one of the sources of grace, of joy, of love, of the life in the spirit that God gives us. And so Paul encourages his congregation, and I would encourage us, that if you haven't yet tested the waters, taken a bite of the grace of giving, try it. I think you're going to like it. You can trust me. It is more blessed to give than to receive. So number one, giving is a means of grace. Number two, giving is about justice, not charity. Giving is about justice, not charity. Verse 13, he says, Our desire is not that others might be relieved while you're hard-pressed, but that there might be equality. At the present time, your plenty will supply what they need, so that in turn, their plenty will supply what you need. The goal is is equality. The goal is equality. This is a little bit embarrassing to admit, but to be totally honest with you, if you would have come to me about two weeks ago and said, Pete, where's that passage in the Bible that's talking about money and it says equality is the goal? I would have said, I, I don't think there is a verse in the Bible that says that. To be completely honest, I've read this. I've preached this many times. But there it is, in Paul's language, clear as day, equality is the goal. So when Paul talks about giving, he doesn't talk about it as an act of charity. He talks about it as an act of justice. In other words, he doesn't see Christian generosity as optional for some Christians some of the time. He sees Christian generosity as necessary appropriate, and right. He sees it as justice. So around here, we've often said that as truth correlates to what is, justice correlates to what ought to be. If I speak or act or live in a way that is in accordance with the way things actually are in the world, then I'm speaking, acting, and living truthfully, or we might call that wisdom. And if I speak, act, and live in accordance with the way things ought to be, we would call that justice. Speaking, acting, and living justly. And so Paul is saying, when we talk about Christian generosity, I'm not talking about charity. I'm not talking out of the goodness of your heart, giving a little back or sharing some of what you have with those who have less. He's talking about the Christian imperative of living justly. So justice is a hot topic in the world we live in at the moment. And everyone seems to have an opinion about this idea of justice. If you've been around Antioch for any length of time, you know that this isn't a new conversation for us. That for over a decade, our church has been pursuing a deeper understanding, a deeper conviction, and a deeper lived reality as it relates to the justice of God. My theology professor, Gary Brashears, at my conservative Christian seminary, said this, that doing justice is inconveniencing yourself for the sake of the poor. And not just the economically poor, but those that are considered less than or out in society, the worthless, the orphan, the widow, the immigrant. Doing justice is inconveniencing yourself for the sake of the poor. And Brashears would say, That injustice, therefore, 
is keeping my own stuff for my own comfort. Injustice is keeping my own stuff for my own comfort. And so as a church, we've been committed to this journey of justice, to the fact that the scriptures reveal to us a just God and a God whose mission on earth is justice, and therefore, as the people of God, we give ourselves to this vocation of seeking and pursuing justice. Justice is the way things ought to be. And Paul says, within the kingdom of God, within the church of Jesus, within God's global household, equality is the goal. Equality is the goal. Tim Keller puts it this way in his wonderful book on this topic, Generous Justice. He says, we do justice when we give all human beings their due as creations of God. Doing, injustice, doing justice excuse me, includes not only the righting of wrongs, but generosity and social concern, especially towards the poor and vulnerable. This kind of life reflects the character of God. It consists in a broad range of activities, from simple, fair, and honest dealings with people in daily life to regular, radically generous giving of your time and resources to activism that seeks to end particular forms of injustice, violence, and oppression. This is the mission of God in the world and the vocation of God's people. We are committed to truth, living in accordance with the way things are, and we are committed to seeking justice, living in accordance with the way things ought to be. And who gets to define the way things ought to be? For us, obviously, it's Jesus. And his vision for life, the way it ought to be, is what we would call the kingdom of God. So he invites us to seek first that kingdom and its righteousness or its justice and to orient our lives around this shared vision. Equality is the goal. First, giving is a means of grace. Secondly, giving is about justice, not charity. And third and finally, giving is the heart of the gospel. If we're looking for the truest motivation for why the Christian community ought to be the most generous community of people on the planet, it's because of this, and he lays it out in verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, that you, through his poverty, might become rich. What more, what greater motivation could Paul give? How could we, those who worship this king who demoted himself from the riches and the comfort and the glory of heaven down to our level, who became one of us, who lived among us, and not as a wealthy person, not as a middle class person, but in the lower class, among those who were in need. He who was rich became poor so that through his poverty we might become rich. We know that because of Christ's gracious generosity in the giving of himself, his life, his death, and his resurrection, now we are the recipients of the greatest grace the world has ever known. Life with him together forever. We follow a king who became poor. And so I'm not commanding you. You don't have to be generous. But I'm encouraging you. If this is at the heart of the God who created this world and created each one of us, if this is at the heart of the gospel of the Jesus who came to us and lived among us and died for us, and if this is the mission that that Jesus is on, to make all things new, including us, 
then generosity isn't just a virtue. It's essential to this new way of being human. It is the way we are meant to live and to thrive and to grow in the kingdom of God. And so as people of God, we are learning to see our abundance as an opportunity to pursue this goal of equality. To see everything that we have not as belonging to us, but as belonging to God. And therefore, as to be stewarded for the sake of his kingdom and his glory. To be a reflection of his son to each other and to the watching world. Amy's going to come and lead us to the table this morning.